welcome to the beginner's guide uh this is by the same people who made the stanley parable which is one of the only good pure walking sims that exists uh so i imagine that this kind of has the same weird uh take on sort of how do i explain it uh games as a meta narrative device if you haven't played the stanley parable uh you should pick it up it's probably it's on sale all the time uh and mm, maybe i'll i'll do a let's play of it sometimes maybe i already have i already have uh time travel's a funny thing so uh without further ado uh let's let's get started Audio's on. Yes, I can hear. Oh, those are pretty simple controls. Hi there. Thank you very much for playing The Beginner's Guide. You're welcome. My name is Davey Reedon. I wrote The Stanley Parable. And while that game tells a pretty absurd story, today... I'm going to tell you about a series of events that happened between 2008 and 2011. We're going to look at the games made by a friend of mine named Coda. Now these games mean a lot to me. Uh, I met Coda in early 2009 at a time when I was really struggling with some personal stuff, and his work pointed me in a very powerful direction. I found it to be a good reference point for the kinds of creative works that I wanted to make. So just to start you off, this is, I think, the first game he ever made. Counter-Strike? for Counter-Strike. You can walk around here, by the way. And uh, mostly it's just Coda learning the basics of building a 3D environment. But what I like is that even though he starts from the simple aesthetic of a desert town, he then scatters these colorful abstract blobs and impossible floating crates around the level. And of course, it destroys the illusion that this actually is a desert town, and instead this level becomes a kind of calling card from its creator. It's like a reminder that this video game was constructed by a real person. And it kind of makes you wonder, what was going through his head as he was building this? This is what I like about all of Coda's games. I mean, not that they're all fascinating as games, but that they are all going to give us access to their creator. I want us to see past the games themselves. I want to get to know who this human being really is. And that's exactly what we're going to do here. So, it's 2008, Coda starts making these games, and he never releases any of them. He doesn't put them onto the internet, he just makes them and then immediately abandons them and they sit on his computer forever. And I think he really understood this image of himself as a recluse. Uh, at one point, he jokingly renamed his computer's recycling bin to Important Games Folder. So, you know, this was just how he worked. He tended to crank them out one after the other without even really pausing to try to understand what he had just made. Until suddenly one day, he just stopped. In 2011, that was it. He made his last game and then he hasn't made another one since. And that's why I've taken this opportunity to gather all of his work together, is because I find his games powerful and interesting, and I'd like this collection to reach him, to maybe encourage him to start creating again. And if the people like you who play this also happen to find his work interesting, then I'm sure it'll just send that much stronger of a message of encouragement to Coda. So thanks for joining me on this. If you have a particular interpretation that I haven't mentioned here, or if you just need to get in touch, you can email me at d-a-v-e-y-w-r-e-d-e-n at gmail.com. Okay, that's about it for introduction. Let's take a look at Coda's first proper game. As each game is loading, I'll show you the date that it was completed. This first one was made in November 2008. Yeah, so... It's just a collection of um, somewhat abstract things. Ooh, hey, a gun. This game is called Escape from Whisper, and it's one of the more generic games you'll see from Coda. <laughs> uh, that's kind of a dig at first person shooters. Oh, hey, hey, blobs. 
you can click to fire the gun. No sounds. Incomplete. Put it into important games folder. Security call breached. Hostile alien life inbound. It kind of looks like this game was abandoned mid-development. Really? For instance, you have this gun, which you'd think would indicate that there are supposed to be oh, monsters or enemies somewhere. But then clearly there are no enemies anywhere. You can't even reload the gun when you nope. run out of bullets. But ultimately we don't really know. Maybe Coda thought that actually it was complete the way that it is. And I think that we should talk about his games for what they are, rather than for what they're not. Enemy force neutralized. Begin to evacuation. What? Okay. I love how you can see the bottom of the universe from this room. <laughs> Strangely enough, this happens uh, a lot in, like, let's call them real games, for lack of a better term. Like in Dark Souls 3 a lot, you can see just corners where they just, like, didn't care and they're like, nobody's gonna look here. And in Dark Souls 1 you can see that a very lot. Apparently, this space station has a labyrinth on it. I... Uh, sure, I don't know. There's really no reason for it that I've ever been able to discern, so in the interest of time, I'm just gonna skip you on past it. Okay, thank you. Okay, this is the part that's interesting. The game has this narrative about the whisper machine and how it has to be turned off, and then you get to the engine room. That's hey, the whisper machine. Hey, there, in the engine room. You could save us all. That beam is powering a whisper machine. We could disrupt it by introducing a great enough heat signature. If you... Your body could stop the beam. It's so much to ask, but for all of our lives, would you do it? Could you give yourself? No choice. Okay. Let's hop on in. Let me pause here for a second. What you just experienced, stepping into the beam and then dying, is probably what Coda had initially intended when he was developing this level. But when he first compiles and plays it, something goes wrong. There's a bug somewhere. And this is what happens instead. Okay. <laughs> I'm becoming one with the universe. And the beam causes the, you to start floating. The concrete floor. And this is at an the important moment for him. Because yes, this is technically a glitch, but Coda identifies something human about it. Like how small it makes you feel in the face of this larger chaotic system. Or this floating could be the afterlife, a peaceful place, juxtaposed against all of the hysteria that you've just had to traverse. I, I don't even know. Uh, I have no idea what he was thinking, but what's clear is that after making this, something lodges itself in his brain. He wants to do more of these really weird and experimental designs. So he stops work on this and moves on to a stream of tiny little games that go in all sorts of directions. Let's go ahead and take a look at the first game he made after leaving this one behind. So breaking kayfabe a bit. There's no way that's accidental. I mean, unless you really screw up. Like, hard. Oh, the past is behind her. Okay. So try walking backwards. Ah. Yep. In this game, you can only walk backwards. But so it's a short and relatively minimalist experiment combining motion and narrative. It is less advanced than the previous game, but actually it seems to be more focused, more complete. Code is trying to give it a unique voice rather than simply basing it on a pre-existing trope. Why does the future keep on changing? When she stops and looks, it becomes clearer. We're moving out of Bricktown. The place is lame. Untexturedville is a lot cooler. If the future is always behind her, how will she find the strength 
to confront it. It's a short little thought, it says what it wants to say, and then it ends. Didn't need anything more than that. Which to me is why it works, because it gets out quick. Okay, next one. Slender? They made Slender too? Wow, that's a hard drop off. You are now entering Slender. So, did I miss a sign? No. I'm just now entering. And that's it. Okay, the meaning of this <sighs> game won't be clear just yet. Please be patient with me for a few more games and I promise you'll see what makes it interesting. Okay, I believe you. Oftentimes, Koda would put bizarre titles like this one at the start of his games. Uh -huh. I wish I'd known him at the time that he was making these early games. He would really only talk to me about his work as he was making it. Once he stopped work on a game, like, that was it. It was dead to him. And I don't agree with that at all, but what are you gonna do? Forget stairs, what's over here? Probably nothing. I know it's tempting, but there's actually nothing over here. Oh, Sorry. yeah. That's what I wanted. Alright. I accept the stairs. As part of my life. What is up here? Once you've been slowed oh, to an no. absolute crawl, the door at the top of the stairs opens. So why, if Code is not showing these games to anyone, why bother opening the door at all? Well, to show you, I'm modifying the game here so that when you press enter, it'll bring you back up to full speed so you can enter the door for yourself. Let's do it. It's a room. Oh. That's a bunch of stuff. You start in a small room until you realize you can just walk through the walls. She plays a loud, bodyless sound, walking... A room that's warm, around and nice, confusing people, and filled with little ideas nothing but giant games. blocks of text explaining what's happening. A normal game where you have to scream into a mic every 15 seconds to keep playing. Plays a pair of floating Kuda eyes would often tell me that he noises. didn't mind if people thought of him as cold or distant. He said that he knew that he was actually a vibrant and compassionate person, but that it takes time to really see that. It can be a very slow climb to get there. A series of lavish manuals come with the game, explain, giving you incorrect instructions on how to play. Is that, uh, what's it called? That game where you have to disarm the bomb? Ready, set, fish. Feels like I've been here before. Well, this is new for Coda. It's an actual puzzle. Go ahead and see if you can solve it. I did it! Yeah. I didn't do it. Don't forget that solution, because we're going to see this puzzle again soon. We're going to see it a lot. Okay. For such a crazy cerebral person with a lot of weird ideas. So that seems to be it, right? You walk down the terrible corridor, puzzle. you solve the puzzle, you get to the end. Simple enough. All right, now I'm going to modify the game again so that when you press enter, it'll remove all of the walls from this room. Oh my god. That's a lot of levels. How about that? There was more to it than we had any way of knowing. I actually find it funny that this game comes after the stairs game since they essentially convey the opposite idea. So uh, in the stairs game, a dull exterior concealed a rich interior. 
And then, in this level, a dull interior hides this fantastic outer world. Either way, I think that the point is the same, is that most of the time you don't get to know what you're missing, or even that you're missing anything. That's not your role as a player. So if your role here is not to understand, then what is it? Hmm. Ah, oh, hey, we're back here. What sign is gonna be here this time? You're now exiting, okay. Aha! Uh -huh. So, this, combined with the entering game from earlier, tells us that Coda believes his games are connected somehow. It could even be that the stairs game and the puzzle game are literally connected in between this and the entering game. There's a bigger picture that all of his games are meant to play a role in, some larger meaning that we won't be able to grasp until we've seen all of them. And once we have, we can step back and start to understand what exactly that bigger picture is. So far it's been a lot of, like, loneliness and isolation. The Great and Lovely Descent. This looks strangely photorealistic. I bet when I come close the graphics are gonna suck though. Let's talk about video game development for a second. Every video game runs on what's called an engine, which determines what the game can and cannot do. So in other words, the engine is a set of tools for game development. Okay. To make all of these games, Coda is using an engine called Source. Like all engines, Source has certain things that it does well, and it has certain things that it does poorly. One of the things that it does very well is boxy linear corridors. Oh. That's why so many of Coda's games are set in these large, flat, empty rooms, is just because he's working with what the engine does well. The tools available to the creator shape what kinds of creative work they're going to end up making. You might consider paying attention to the architecture in Coda's games, to notice how they seem to stem from an engine that's very good at producing linear, boxy corridors. It turned into a cell shaded game. For no reason. Ah. Let's go this way. And from here, it's just a spiral staircase downwards uh, until we get to the the dead zone. Oh, no fall damage. That function hasn't been put in yet. I've been taking a, a online class about game development, so this is kind of interesting to me. Not that it wouldn't have been uninteresting otherwise, but um, I played a little bit of it before a while back, and uh, that's a bit of a different perspective. There is a almost invisible wall. Okay, what's what's down here? Nothing. Okay. I recognize these Half-Life 2 assets. Oh hey. Thank you, elevator. I hope. prison now? Oh, okay. This uh, prison, yeah, I am. funny enough, mm. in Coda's original design, the door stayed shut for a full hour before letting you go. If you don't mind, I think we're gonna skip that. Yes, I'd appreciate that. This is something that he and I used to argue about a lot. You know, whether a game ought to actually be playable, 
whether it means anything if no one can get through it. All the irony. And I would always defend that, you know, all this work goes into the game, why not make it playable and accessible? And so we just got into heated arguments over it, and there was one time that after one of these conversations, he went home, and a day or two later, he sent me a zip file entitled Playable Games that was full of hundreds of individual games, each of which was just an empty box that you walked around in and nothing else. Believe me, I played every <laughs> single one of those just to find out if there was like a gag hidden somewhere. There wasn't. good okay outside what do you have for me more three dots what are these probably some hidden secret somewhere it's the puzzle again with the exact same solution as the last time yay There's still no clear indication of what makes this puzzle so special that Coda is going to return to it over and over. But I promise I'll share with you my interpretation very shortly. I promise. Linear corridors. Hey buddy, listen, speak. You there? Did you come Here, up from Coda above? begins what using a kind there? of dialogue system that he fashioned out uh, of the engine's chat capabilities. Use the one, two, three buttons on your keyboard to respond. Yeah, I guess that. Uh, yeah, there was an enormous prison that I spent hours in. Speak. That's the world above. You've been there. This is important. Did you have to get through a puzzle with two doors and switches? Um. I'd prefer not to tell you. After all, we've only just met. What? But you... you don't understand. We are trapped here. That puzzle is our only escape. We need to get through it. Uh... You think you want to get through, but trust me, you don't. Oh no, but I do. We do. We need to get out of there. Do you understand? It is the most important thing in the world. We have to escape this prison. There must be an ending. I promise you there's nothing I want more. Listen. Hmm. I... Nope. Alright, I guess that's that. Guys aren't very, uh, persuasive. Oh, hey guys again. Uh, no, I've been here the entire time. I suggest you go and see the puzzle sometime. It's not meant to be solved, but you can sit in the back place in the middle. Uh, what happens if I solve it? Not sure, but if I have any suspicion, what you find won't be worth what it takes to get there. I'll have another chance to solve it soon. Okay. Now I'm going down. I thought I was going to just loop back into that room until I gave the right answer, but okay. And so we make one last descent down to the final floor of the level. Where the puzzle awaits. Or not. It's a lamppost. Okay, yep. I can't tell you quite why, but for some reason, Coda fixates on this lamppost. It's going to appear at the end of every single one of his games from here on out. I'll tell you what I think. Uh, I think that up to this point, you know, he's been making really strange and abstract games with no clear purpose, and maybe you can only float around in that headspace for so long. Because now he wants something to hold on to. He wants a reference point. He wants the work to be leading to something. He wants a destination, which is what this lamppost is. It's a destination. We're going to see it in the work as well. His games are just going to become a lot more cohesive, a lot more fully developed, with more of a clear idea behind them. And as we go, that idea will get clearer and clearer and clearer. Yeah, I mean, if 
you have to have an end goal. That isn't a bad one. It's a guiding light in the dark. It's something that you can kind of get a grasp at, and it's a universal signal. 